Hi, if you're just joining us, I'm Matilda Gregg, the lead organiser of this workshop. This paper is part of a panel called Activism and Exclusion, which highlights the stories of women warriors who history books and media coverage have typically overlooked. The three videos in this panel, though all set in very different contexts, each show women fighting for inclusion in the category of soldier or warrior, and for the power to define for themselves what those words mean. Make sure to keep watching for the powerful histories of individual indigenous women warriors in the 19th century North America and the multifaceted roles they took on. Our next speaker is Suzanne McLeod, who is a writer, educator and researcher in the areas of social community and cultural development with indigenous peoples from across Canada, with a deep understanding of the complexity of cultures and histories that form the First Nations story. Her academic background includes a PhD and an MA in art history from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque in, U in the USA, plus a BA in Indian art from the University of Regina, SIFC. She possesses experience in working with indigenous elders and knowledge keepers and with non-indigenous systems and governments at the municipal, provincial and federal levels. Her paper today is titled Indigenous Women Warriors of the Americas, 19th Century. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening uh, from, uh, from me to you. Um, as Matilda said, I am Suzanne McLeod. I am Anishinaabe um, from Saging First Nation in Manitoba here in Canada. And um, as she said, I recently received my PhD in Native American art and art history through the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I am here to talk to you about uh, the indigen indigenous women warriors uh, of the Americas of the 19th century. So to set the stage um, is an understanding that we, uh, we, I want to present first. So many of our indigenous nations in the, in the Americas were matrilineal, meaning the rights, the property, and the lineage were passed down through the female lines. So I really speak in generalities here simply because I only have 20 minutes to speak. Um, each Indigenous nation had their own unique complex system of belief, their language, and ways of being that were adapted over millennium according to their environments. So overall, Indigenous nations function on the principles of reciprocity, balance, and respect for all living beings. Uh, this included human, animal, fish, bird, and spirit. Uh, this included the rights of the child, the man, and the woman each who carried specific roles and responsibilities within the community. So many uh, individuals carried multiple names throughout their lifetimes, names that were given in recognition of the deeds that, that uh, she or he had uh, achieved or completed or took part in. Uh, we'll see this in the names of the women warriors in this presentation. So indigenous people saw the warrior not merely as one who fought in battle and warfare, but rather one who assumed a role of protector of land, language, culture, song, belief, uh, memory, family, and community. We were, and largely still are, an oral people. Uh, memory was critical to cultural continuity and survival. A warrior was considered more capable if she or he could remember, translate, negotiate, and defend their community through diplomacy and protocol. Uh, this is why ceremony is considered to be so essential in meeting visitors and outsiders even today. So as a last resort, uh, a warrior would engage in battle and, and military warfare. So understanding this context, we, don't, we know that many of our women warriors uh, were overlooked in the history books. So under Indigenous systems, we, under, we understood the warrior uh, was also the women who maintained stability of the family, uh, they fed their children and their relatives. They sewed, be beautified, and clothed their community, birthed and raised their children in all seasons, uh, assumed the roles of healers and decision makers, buried those who passed on, and transferred cultural and community knowledge through stories, song, and language that ensured integrity for those who followed. However, once the European arrived with a system of patriarchy, the concept of warrior became singular, uh, defined only through the lens of military warfare and masculinity. Despite this, the Indigenous woman warrior did not disappear uh, and their importance did not subside. Women continued to maintain the nations through the most horrific years of the 19th century, into the 20th and into the 21st. 
So what is changing really, once again, is how we define them. So today we are activists, artists, lawyers, educators, engineers, doctors, leaders, and of course, mothers, uh, aunties, and grandmothers. So having said this, uh, let's understand how and why the concept of the women warrior was changed with the arrival of the European uh, in America. So we have a 16th century map created by Flemish engraver, uh, Theodore de Bry. It is titled Map of the New World. Uh, it has a Latin name also, uh, which I'm not going to try to, uh, to pronounce. Uh, there are several points here to note um, in looking at it. So first, significant are the four figures that uh, surround the map. And this is uh, clockwise from the top left. First is Christopher Columbus, uh, Italian explorer on the top left. Uh, on the top right, we have Italian navigator Amerigo uh, Vespucci. On the bottom right, we have Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro. And on the bottom left, we have Ferdinand uh, Magellan, um, a Portuguese explorer. Uh, they're all men. So early on, surveillance and discovery of the New World was assumed by the European male. In and I use um, the New World in quotations because to us, it is simply home, it's not the New World um, as Indigenous people. Secondly, America, and by extension, all of its inhabitants became gendered by the newcomers, by the Europeans. Um, 16th century European explorers mistook North America as being Cathay in the Far East. The Portuguese uh, called the New World Antia. Uh, the etymology is disputed um, at, as meaning either island discovered or phantom island. The Spanish called it the Indies, uh, giving rise to the term Indians for indigenous people encountered. And by 1507, uh, German cartographers first used the term America on a large 12 uh, panel, panel map uh, after Italian Amerigo Vespucci. So they feminized Vespucci's name to be consistent with other Latinized country names such as Europa and Asia, and it stuck. So over time, it became collectively known as America. So accordingly, allegorical representations of America became that of a female. This embedded a gendered attitude that she was to be rightly conquered, subverted, and controlled. Uh, this image and this attitude has persisted over the centuries. Um, think of the Statue of Liberty in New York City, uh, the, the struggle for women's rights in the 20th century, etc. So here we have an early 17th century example of America by Chris, uh, Crispin de Passe. It's an engraving. It, it depicts a bare-breasted indigenous princess, scantily clad, uh, who sits among many objects associated with America. Uh, the bow and arrows, the feathers, the jewels. She wears a headdress and is surrounded by the essence of wildness, animals, lizards, snakes, uh, leopards. There are severed limbs uh, suggesting cannibalism and there's images of devil worship. Uh, there's fire, there's dancing in the background. And there's decapitated heads that imply in, um, uncivilized and inferior societies. A male servant brings her severed heads. This conveys her ability as a female to take on the roles of violence and cruelty, um, qualities that are that are typically associated with men. Uh, therefore, America becomes justifiably quashed in the eyes of uh, Europeans. Uh, so this no, nuanced narrative of she power psychologically uh, distances America from that of the more civilized European society, uh, thus creating a, really a social, uh, cultural, and gendered fissure at this early stage of contact. So, from the time of first contacts in Americas, Indigenous people and women were viewed according to the economic, the political, the social uh, needs of the outsiders. These are the Europeans, the French, the English, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Russians. Um, it's important to note, though, um, that we as Indigenous people never changed our perspectives of ourselves. We were always, uh, for example, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, um, or we were Cree, Nehea, or Haudenosaunee, Iroquois, um, Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, uh, Onondaga, Mohawk, or we were Blackfoot, Nitsitapi, or Sioux, Ositi, Sakawan, or Wabanaki and Abenaki, or Haida, Zaida, or Tlingit, Kwan. And this is just to name a few of the 600 plus uh, Indigenous nations in North America. So now, let's turn to the women warriors who defended their families, their culture, and their territories in every sense of the word. 
uh, as leaders, as fighters, diplomats, and as explorers in both the Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, indig contexts. Um, our focus here is, is primarily the 19th century. So our first warrior is Pine Leaf, uh, woman chief of the Absaroka, known as a Crow Nation in present-day South Central Montana. Uh, she was born into the Gros Ventre, the White Clay Tribe, in 1806. She was named Pine Leaf as a child. When she was 10 years old, she was kidnapped by an Absaroka uh, Crow uh, raiding party and adopted by a Crow man to replace uh, his recently deceased son. He trained Pine Leaf um, to have warrior skills and she proved to be a natural warrior. In her first battle, Pine Leaf defended a fort sheltering Crow and white families from Blackfoot warriors, uh, traditional en enemies of the Crow. She killed two Black, uh, Blackfoot men and captured a large herd of horses. She then gathered a group of her own warriors and attacked Blackfoot settlements as revenge. Later, she proved her skill as a gifted strategist, earning the Crow name Biawa Shichish, or a woman chief. Um, she was given a, a position in the Council of Chiefs among the highest honor an, in, an individual could achieve. So she became a, uh, famous throughout the region for her skill and her prowess. Uh, woman's chief appearance um, was deceiving, however. Upon meeting her for the first time, an American trader wrote that she looked neither savage nor warlike. She sat with her hands in her laps, folded as when one, as when one prays. She is about 45 years old and appears modest and good natured. So woman chief took four wives over her lifetime and was considered, and was considered a chief and a diplomat for over 20 plus years. She was killed in 1854 by Gross Venture, White Clay Warriors, her own people, while on a peace mission to her birthplace. So our next uh, warrior is a Sagagawea, uh, sometimes called Sagagawea. She is thought to have been born um, circa 1788 in what is now Idaho. She is known for famously leading the Lewis and Clark expedition as they explored and opened up the Northwest regions of America between 1803 to 1806. So at the age of 10, um, Tagagawea was captured by the Hidatsa Mandan people, an enemy tribe based in present day North Dakota. She was then sold and married to a French Canadian trader, Toussaint uh, Charbonneau. And he was a rather inept uh, provider and hunter. When Lewis and Clark made their way to Hidatsa territory in 1803, um, Charbonneau was hired as a guide and interpreter with the intention to take Sagagawea and their newborn son, Pomp, uh, along as protection. A party as large as the expedition, 40 plus boats, would not have been seen as a threat if they were traveling with a woman and child along with them. So, but Sagagawea proved to be much more of a valuable asset than her husband, despite the fact that she was carrying an infant on her back. As a former captive, uh, she spoke her own language, Shoshone, uh, plus that of her captors, Hidatsa Mandan. Uh, so this ensured less misinterpretation between the whites and the indigenous peoples encountered along the way. This was a skill that literally saved the lives of expedition members on several occasions. More importantly, Tsagagawea knew the protocols and the modes of behaviors that were expected by other nations in whose territory Lewis and Clark traveled through. So acting as a translator and diplomat, Tsagagawea skillfully steered the expedi expedition through both uh, friendly and hostile territory. As a woman, she represented uh, peace and trustworthiness. Uh, as an interpreter, she represented survival. Sagagawea was um, as much brave as she was gracious and knowledgeable. In a famous incident in which Charbonneau was steering the boat through choppy waters, a sudden storm capsized them. Um, full of valuable supplies, uh, such as navigation equipments, uh, books, gunpowders, medicines, and clothing, uh, the loss would have been devastating to the, uh, to the overall expedition. Charbonneau froze. Uh, he was unable to do anything. Sagagawea, uh, in turn, calmly jumped into the water and managed to rescue all the supplies from the river, all the while by, uh, with carrying a baby on her back. So in 1805, the expedition reached the Pacific Ocean, uh, where the mouth of the Columbia River empties into the uh, sea, having walked, portage, and paddled literally hundreds of miles through unknown territories. So when Lewis and Clark made the decision where to locate 
their winter camp that year on the coast, they included Sagagui's voice um, in the vote. So this was a sign of their deep respect for her. Upon com completion, the uh, expedition re returned to the uh, Hidatsamandan villages where Sagagawea had first joined them. Charbonneau was paid uh, $500 and given 320 acres of land. Sagagawea received nothing. Regardless, Sagagawea was uh, a, re a true warrior uh, on the, based on the strengths of her accompl uh, accomplishments as a um, explorer, as an educator, as a diplomat, and as a mother. So our next warrior is Sarah Winnemanka, uh, born in 1844, uh, the daughter of Chief Winnemanka of the Numa, known to non-natives as uh, the Paiutes. Their territory lies in present-day Nevada and California. At her birth, she was given the name uh, Thekmatani, meaning shell flower. So many of her family members were killed in the Paiute War of 1860 against the United States. Uh, this is in the present day region of Las Vegas. So Sarah and her sisters attended a white convent school in San Jose, California at the request of her grandfather who saw the need uh, to learn uh, the white men ways. Uh, they were forced to leave when the white parents complained that their children were attending school uh, with Indians. And I, and I put this in quotations because that was the language of the day. Uh, however, Sarah was blessed with the gift of language and learned to speak English and Spanish uh, in the short time that she was there. This made her multilingual, a valuable skill that uh, served her well throughout her lifetime. So during the Bannock War of uh, 1878 between the U.S military and the Bannock Indians, en enemies of the, uh, of the NUMA, Sarah worked as a messenger, as an interpreter, and scout for the U.S. Army. Uh, at this time, she later wrote, uh, this was the hardest work I ever did for the government in all my life, having been in the saddle day and night, distance about 223 miles. Yes, I went for the government when the officers could not get an Indian man or a white man to go for love or money. I, only an Indian woman, went and saved my father and his people. Her father and some tribesmen were uh, kidnapped by the Bannock and held as captives. Uh, so Sarah operated really as a peacemaker and a warrior advocate when many of her people forced onto reservations um, starved because they were prevented from hunting, fishing and gathering. And although the federal government sent money, food and supplies uh, to the community, most of it was pocketed by the Indian agents and the mercenaries employed to help the Numa. Sarah saw this, and because she could speak English and write it, she began to uh, speak openly of the plight of her, her people who exiled from their homelands in Nevada and moved to Washington State under the reservation system, became subject to the corruption uh, of government officials employed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, she argued with the Indian agent and wrote long letters to the military and government uh, leaders, actions that garnered much attention in, in the larger context. So ultimately, Sarah, her father, and Paiute leaders were invited to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Secretary of the Interior, who worked under U.S. President uh, Rutherford Hayes, himself a staunch lawyer and abolitionist against uh, slavery. While there, she and other leaders uh, were promised a return to their, ter to their own territory, a promise that, of course, was never carried out. Sarah then escalated her fight uh, for re reform beyond petitions and letters. She began to lecture in San Francisco, describing the plight of not only uh, the Paiute, but of all Native Americans uh, forced onto reservations. She was then invited to lecture in New England, speaking to, uh, nearly 300 uh, times, meeting notable individuals such as Ra Ralph Waldo, em Waldo Emerson, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Senator Henry Dawes, uh, among others. She was the first Native, Native American woman to do so. In 1883, uh, Sarah wrote a publication entitled uh, Life Among the Paiutes, their wrongs and claims, and it's still in circulation today. Tired and disillusioned by broken and empty promises, Sarah eventually stopped lecturing, living her life between two worlds, uh, the Numa, some of whom felt betrayed by her, and the white world, who never really fully accepted her. After this, she started a school for Paiute children, teaching them to read and write in English, a school that was soon um, thereafter closed by the government. 
uh, under the new policies. So Sarah passed away in 1891 and, uh, at the age of 47. She was still a warrior advocate for her people, uh, speaking for them when they did not have a voice and leaving a legacy of leadership and advocacy that still resonates today, really. Uh, she became immortal in a sense because I'm sitting here telling you her story in the 21st century to you. Indigenous women warriors from the 19th century are typically uh, remembered in history through their types of relationships uh, that they had with white settlers moving westward across a continent. Uh, rather than on the strengths of their own individual character and achievements, uh, part of this is because uh, Euro-American society recognized only the men who took, took part in events. For example, when the Cree and the Anishinaabe people uh, made, made treaty with the Crown in uh, 1871, uh, you may call it signed treaty, uh, at Lower Fort Garry in, uh, near Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I am right now, uh, it was reported that approximately 1,000 people attended. Uh, the women who accompanied their husbands and their male relatives were simply not included in the overall count by government, official, uh, by government officials. Uh, so this marginalization uh, distorts the accuracy of the history as we know it. Uh, so how many other times has this happened and what have we missed because of it? So it is critical to recognize that these women are remembered by their own peoples through oral history, through storytelling, through song, uh, and through memory. Uh, the impacts of colonialism and the coming of the Europeans uh, on Indigenous nations of the Americas was devastating. For the Indigenous woman, it silenced the equality and status which had existed prior to this. So at the beginning, I spoke of the matrilineal systems that existed before colonization. Uh, with the making of the treaties and the introduction of the Indian Act, uh, formal legislation in Canada uh, developed under European patriarchy women lost their voice and power as leaders and decision makers. The band council system was introduced and rights, what little existed, uh, became focused only through the male. For example, under the new system, if an indigenous man married a non-indigenous woman, he retained all his rights. However, if an indigenous woman married a non-indigenous man, she not only lost all her rights uh, for herself, but also that of her children. Our women warriors um, fought to the Supreme Court of Canada in the 1980s and won back our rights uh, to which we agreed under treaty. So with this, it can be said that Indigenous women warriors in any form, in any era or arena are the ones who sustain the spirit of the people through centuries of cultural, social and political upheavals. So uh, against the backdrop of uh, resiliency and reclamation, Contemporary Métis uh, Algonquin Irish artist Sherry Farrell Reset shows us in her brilliant image uh, here, ancestral uh, women taking back their dresses. A nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground, then it is done, no matter how brave its warriors or strongest weapons. Uh, this is a proverb attributed to Sistas, a Cheyenne. Our hearts are not, definitely not on the ground and we continue to be strong as women warriors in the 21st century. So I wanna say thank you to these women who came before me, and I wanna thank you for listening. Chima Gretsch. Thanks so much for watching this talk, which was part of the Activism and Exclusion panel. If you haven't already, go check out the other two talks in this panel by clicking the links on screen now.